So welcome, guys. I think there's a lot of people on the call tonight, which is lovely, as always. Um, for people that have not listened to me speak before, just a, a little brief introduction. Uh, so my name is Stephen Marks. I'm registered mental health nurse, uh, regular contributor to CPD Me. As Andrew said, been doing a good few sessions, so definitely check out the back catalogue because um, the series is designed to kind of complement each other and kind of build on the knowledge. Uh, been qualified as a mental health nurse since 2013. Um, I'm also a qualified ACP, but I'm currently uh, a senior lecturer in mental health nursing. Um, and from time to time, I do an odd bit of work uh, as a, an expert witness, really looking at kind of civil liability claims. That tends to be when cases get brought against the NHS when there's suicide involved. So I like to think I know my stuff. I know there's a few kind of regular viewers on here. Um, and what we're going to be looking at tonight um, is really an overview of psychosis, thinking about primary psychosis um, and, and schizophrenia and kind of what, what schizophrenia is, what it isn't. Um, and we'll refresh a little bit on antipsychotics. And the next seminar that's coming up in July, um, although I said I, these seminars I do tend to build on each other, this is the first one that really is a kind of proper two-parter. It was just too big to fit into kind of one session. So what we're looking at today is kind of primary or psychiatric psychosis. And then in the next one next month, we'll be looking at organic psychosis. So that's when you get psychosis as a result of a medical cause, um, some kind of physical um, thing that's gone wrong. Um, I think as mental health nurses or mental health professionals, we're very good at spotting what we're looking at tonight, the primary psychosis, but not so good on the organic. Um, and likewise, if you are working with older adults or kind of ITU, you might be really good at kind of picking out the organic psychosis, but not so much on this. I think I've tried to make this quite relevant to practice. You know, I could sit here and, you know, I could. Else's. And this was really despite the absence of surgical scars or even just biological common sense that no such operation would take place. And even when you kind of gently challenge that or ask how that came about or, you know, pointed out that that perhaps wouldn't be possible, the person still holds that belief. So that's the key point about a delusion. It's even when presented with the evidence, you still maintain that belief. Um, harder to kind of pick out or when delusions are perfectly plausible, but just happen to be false. Um, if you've worked around kind of any kind of mental health setting, um, you'll probably know that, you know, delusions about being followed, about surveillance, um, that old kind of stereotype and cliche about kind of people wearing tin foil hats, that all kind of harkens back to, to these delusional beliefs. Um, but, you know, I think that nowadays, it's, it can be quite hard to disprove some delusions, some thoughts that people might be being followed or that the police are involved. So again, how can you actually disprove that? It's about kind of taking the bigger picture there. Um, Capgras syndrome is a little kind of a little diagnosis I like to throw in. It always reminds me of, I don't know if anyone watched House many years ago, where there was always a bit of a kind of medical mystery to be unpicked. It was one of those kind of strange uh, diagnoses or, or, or things to talk through. Um, but Capgras is a delusional belief that a loved one has been replaced by an identical looking imposter. And the reason that I've brought this in um, it's because I think it's a really interesting case study about advancements in medicine. Now, until there's a strong genetic component, we know that dopamine um, is implicated. Uh, you're also more likely to have it if you've got physical brain abnormalities and if you experienced um, a traumatic birth or there was issues in pregnancy, your child is more likely to develop it there. Um, people with schizophrenia go through what's called a prodrome, which is the kind of build up to a disease, the early symptoms. And I think the reason that it doesn't get diagnosed until 20s is because it looks a lot like depression. Um, it looks a lot like typical teenager 
you know, if anyone's got kids, they can be a little bit withdrawn. They don't want to speak to you. They don't want to know you. And for a lot of parents, that can just seem like typical teenager. Um, you know, it's relatively rare schizophrenia. Um, so I don't think everyone needs to be worrying that their child is going to develop this. But there are some key things to look out for, really, which indicates your kid or your young person is perhaps not just having, having that normal uh, teenage experience. Little infographic here. So when we think about positive, what this basically means is over and above the normal human experience. So delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech and thinking, you know, that's all extra. You know, hopefully we're all kind of free of hallucinations. It's not part of the normal kind of range of, of what you are expected to experience. So that's why it's called positive. Um, and negative are the things that typically affect people later in life or when they've ha had the disease longer, but they're arguably more kind of disabling, more disruptive to that person. Um, there's a lot more to mental health nursing and mental health care than just, you know, pushing medication, which is very important. But most of what you're going to do to unpick those negative uh, symptoms um, is just psychosocial intervention. Um, so that's looking at people's stressors. Uh, the stress vulnerability model is something that you might have come across. Um, things like CBT can be very helpful. Cognitive behavioral therapy, very helpful for helping people to cope with voices. Um, social inclusion, supporting people to appointments, activity scheduling, sounds dead basic, uh, something that we all probably do, but people with, you know, we don't want to imply that everyone's at the same level of functioning. So if you're pumped full of antipsychotics, really struggling to get out of bed, a really helpful intervention could be if someone sits down and plans your week with you um, so that you know what you're doing and what you can actually manage. Um, resilience training is an idea as well, just helping people to cope. Um, some people, their symptoms will go away with medication. Some people, they won't. But what will change is them. They can actually get to a point where they can live with their voices. It's a bit like, oh, leave me alone. And it's not distressing. It's not scary. It's more of an inconvenience. Um, I guess like living with any kind of chronic illness, um, we can't always cure it or treat it or make it vanish. Uh, but we can support people to live their best life around it. Um, family support, really, really important as a, a PSI, a psychosocial intervention. Um, you can support family around illness awareness, help family to spot those early warning signs. What is it that your loved one starts to do that's a little bit strange when they're becoming unwell? We've got this idea within mental health of expressed emotion. Um, so with families with high expressed emotion, there can be critical comments, hostility, over-involvement, interfering, um, and that's linked to increased rates of relapse. Low expressed emotion, we're talking about warmth, support, positive regard, understanding of symptoms, family being supported. Again, bit of a disclaimer, I'm speaking very much about the UK here, um, but you can refer into mental health services. The team that would be responsible for that would be called early intervention and psychosis. So you look for EI services under mental health teams and they have a very swift response. There's kind of national guidelines that they need to assess within two weeks of them being made aware of someone that's potentially psychosis. So, you know, they treat that as seriously as the two week wait for cancer. That's how important it is that we get that early intervention out there. Um, again, don't forget, psychosis is not the same as schizophrenia. All psychosis will likely involve, sorry, all schizophrenia will likely involve some kind of psychosis, but not all psychosis will progress to schizophrenia. And that's something that we can build in a bit of hope about if you are working with someone that's psychotic. Um, and again, I put this in most of my lectures, it does tend to come up. Um, command hallucinations to harm yourself or others remain a red flag and need emergency escalation. So if you are not a mental health professional, ideally you want to get that person to A&E or seen by the home-based treatment team, you know, that day uh, if possible. 
In terms of what's coming up next, we are going to build on some of these ideas, but we're more going to look at the organic psychosis. So we'll be looking at delirium and we'll be looking at a vast array of other conditions that can cause psychosis. But critically, we are going to learn how to differentiate between the two and look at how treatment varies, because if we get this wrong and we start trying to treat people with delirium, with antipsychotics, it's going to end up in bad outcomes. So we'll be taking a real critical look at that on our next session.